Welcome, everybody. Um, I'll just repeat everything I said before. But um, this is uh, the first Wicked session uh, that we're organizing with Wicca, the Women in Cybersecurity Group of Amsterdam and Surroundings. Uh, but we like to call ourselves the only Women in Cybersecurity Group in the Netherlands that is active. Um, so a few months ago, we had uh, the OFSEC training, offensive security training, uh, for two days, uh, which was uh, apparently very uh, entertaining and people really liked it. So we decided to condense uh, the material of this training into some kind of uh, more lecture-like uh, thing. Uh, so that's why it was said on me that those who have attended the training, um, they would get bored uh, because it's basically the same slides, but a bit more condensed. So we wanted to do this as Wicked, Wicked Education, you know, the, the pun, uh, because it fits the Wicca theme. Um, so that, that's why, and we want to do much, many more uh, set wicked sessions with this. Uh, I hope to be able to organize one on binary exploitation and more on digital forensics. Uh, we want to do maybe something uh, more management-like uh, with governance and how to actually manage your cybersecurity teams. Uh, so that would be really nice. That these are plans for the future. So we're going to start with part one and the date. We all know, but. It's, it's <laughs> So, um, in order to get a good idea of uh, who's in this room, um, I'd like to go for a bit of uh, introduction. Uh, so, uh, raise your hand if you come from a technical background. Yeah. And if you come from a more management, governance background. Okay. And I'm actually curious as to, for the, for the management people, um, why, like, more, what, what do you want to learn with offensive security? Why, why would you think it's a good thing you want to learn? For example, you. Sure. Um, so, hi everyone, I'm Lea Wai, um, and I'm a project manager. I've been working in the data privacy and information security area for the past three years, but more on a high level. So, whenever this kind of tech terms come up, um, I know a bit of it, but I would really like to see how, it's, how yeah. it works in practice. So, that's why I'm here. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah, so... To be more info of specifics, uh, these are the, the categories I made up uh, to, to see where we can fit people. Uh, so raise your hand if you don't know anything about computers. That's like you've never touched a computer. I assume that, that that's not the case. You work in IT but not security. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, you work in security but not technical. <laughs> yeah, I know you. <laughs> uh, you work in security but not offensive. Yeah. And you work in offensive security. Okay. And you are, I, for, I forgot this uh, category of, <laughs> you work with IT, but, <laughs> okay. Uh, if the definition of offensive security is uh, pen testing, uh, red teaming, uh, basically hacking into things, uh, website, uh, hardware, these things. Um, yeah. So, what is Wicca? The, the preaching. Uh, so we are a circle for ladies um, across the Netherlands uh, who are interested or who work in InfoSec, uh, information security. And what we want to create with this is a space where we can just learn and meet with each other, uh, wear whatever we like, and not worry about uh, anything, but just learning things. And uh, what we want to offer is uh, discussions on uh, exploits, forensics, uh, incident response, offensive security, but most of all have fun, so make bad crypto jokes because we love these. And uh, we also welcome uh, more people, of course, because we've had mixed sessions before. Uh, we don't want to be this all-exclusive uh, all group. We, we basically want to show the world that we're open to, to anything, and we also want to welcome people who feel that they want to join this space uh, for learning everything about InfoSec. So who we are, uh, Andrea is a security consultant at Deloitte. She does pen testing of web applications and uh, uh, less boring stuff. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but Deloitte is great, uh, great teams. And uh, <laughs> I work as an ethical hacker at KPN, uh, the red, KPN Red Team. Uh, so we do also pen testing of web applications and less boring stuff. Um, hardware sometimes, which is also fun. And sometimes we even get to break into buildings, and these are the, the most fun sessions. We actually had a session about social engineering uh, earlier this year, and we actually want to do one uh, 
with a professional social engineer, a guy or a girl who, uh, who would want to come to us. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Um, yeah. And basically the, the reason uh, why we got into OPSEC, uh, for me was, uh, because I was first in defense. Uh, I was working for a security operations center. So constantly looking at Wireshark, uh, PCAP logs. Uh, and I got bored <laughs> and then I went into making, uh, more defense stuff. Uh, and then I was like, you know what? I'm just tired of this and tired of machine learning things. So I'm just gonna hack and break things. And I'm pretty happy with that. Um, do you want to share your reason why you got into offensive security? Uh, sure. Mine was a lot more random than Valentine's because <laughs> I was studying business and then, uh, in my spare time, I did a bunch of coding and web app stuff. Um, and then I attended a random security event that introduced me to everything from privacy to red teaming to social engineering to pen testing. And then I decided to slightly switch my path and then start doing all the pen testing stuff on the side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to share why you got into OFSEC? Why I got it? <laughs> um, well, my background is in hospitality and retail. I've worked there uh, in the both business for 18 years. I got bored with that, so I got into functional testing. Uh, and after a couple of months in functional testing, I went to one of our in house CTFs, our Caps to Flag events. Um, I won together with my colleague, and then I was nice. Do you like security? Yeah, would you like to come over? <laughs> sure. So I moved over to the Society Red Team beginning this year. I'm doing now offensive security. Uh, ethical hacking for about uh, six months. This might be a bit boring for you then. <laughs> Everything is always new for me. So. The, the, so this course is meant as an introduction. Um, yeah, so. in, in 18 years, mm -hmm. I've worked in different fields. Uh, every introduction, every uh, promotion, I always pick up something new. Yeah. So. Actually, even picked up new things making these slides. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's very useful to go back to the basics sometimes. Uh, so this is the planning for uh, this evening. Uh, so the first part where we had the hello world with the introduction rounds. Then we're going to talk about organizational networks. So how uh, networks in companies kind of tend to look like your typical uh, infrastructure. Uh, then we're going to go into the basics of web application hacking with some basic uh, hacking demos. Uh, then we're going to talk about the tools that are used uh, that we use mostly in our daily uh, job uh, to perform penetration testing. Uh, then we talk about in initial compromise because, yeah, you get uh, access to a computer, you hack your way into a computer, uh, that, that's the initial compromise, but then what do you do? Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about uh, the web application security, uh, let's say, pillars of web application security through presenting OWASP stuff. And uh, then the second part would be a little bit of a refresher uh, after the break. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, network compromisation, so... Uh, instead of focusing on applications and web applications, uh, what, what do you do when you're faced with an entire network? Uh, and then comes the hands-on session with Metasploit, which is a very powerful penetration testing tool, uh, exploitation tool. And then privilege escalation. So we, you probably, you compromise the computer, but you do not have all the rights on this computer. You know, you're not administrator or uh, root, as we must say. So how can you escalate, ele elevate privileges? And then something about, how do you defend against all of this? And that starts with logging, logging all the data that goes into your computer. And uh, with logs and uh, log analysis, you can spot where you got hacked. And then ra we wrap this up. All good? So organizational networks and where to find them in organizations. So this would be your typical um, organizational network. So you are at a company uh, that, so this is very simplified. So you have one router which is connected to the internet and then everybody is uh, in some sort of a, a directed acyclic diagram. Uh, oh, they're basically connected to this router and everybody can connect to the internet. So in this case you have router, Wi-Fi router, this, world, this would be by BYOD device, bring your own devices, they're all connected to Wi-Fi. Router is connected to a switch and then you have a ring of PCs and then you have another switch because we have a lot of switches in companies and you don't want to see the graph for KPN is horrible, huge. 
And then we have different devices that are connected to uh, to this computer and then phones and there's maybe a server that it could be a web server. So, <clears throat> oh, sorry. If you want to um, hack into this network, imagine you want to uh, get access to this machine. What would come up with... Well, what idea would you have to, to maybe hack into this machine if you already are in this network? Can you think of something? You? <laughs> so, yeah. So that would be one. So you are in this network. You, may, you manage to maybe social engineer your way inside the building. And as you can see here, we have uh, some Ethernet uh, plugs and you manage to plug yourself in and you ac have access to this network. At this point, what you would do is you would kind of sweep through the network and see, okay, are there any devices that are vulnerable for uh, very famous exploits or that are outdated or these things? And often you would find things in printers. Um, in this case, you would maybe compromise the printer, and then you uh, move through, uh, through the network like this. Um, so yeah, so this would be the, the, the idea of a simple network, and it scales to thousands of switches, thousands of routers, millions of... Because in this diagram we were talking about this web, the server, uh, so that's why, uh, I mean, Nowadays, everything is on the web, and well, web application hacking is something that we also spend most of our time on when we do pen testing. So you can imagine that this is one of the, the most important things uh, to learn if you do offensive security. And actually, there was a great ad advice that was given to me by someone from Bay Cybersecurity, <laughs> which was, if you want to have a career in security, learn web hacking. Like, if you want to be a CISO or if you want to be a manager, it doesn't matter, uh, even if you want to be super technical, but learn web hacking because you would be able to get any job with this. Uh, so, to talk about web hacking, first we need to learn a bit about the architecture of websites. The most common one, if you're familiar with uh, Python, then this would be a kind of a Django uh, application. Um, but we took PHP because PHP is a very common and it's also broken. <laughs> so, so in this case, you have a, a typical thing. You have like a database and then, uh, the, all the, your data is stored into the model. Uh, the controller is, uh, the thing between the model and the view and the view is your UI and the controller basically swaps the, the, the data around. This is a typical MVC architecture in, uh, in the web applications. And then you have users that connect through HTTP. Uh, the website is HTML based, has a lot of uh, JavaScript, jQuery, all these uh, languages that are based on JavaScript that you would find in the UI. And then the user is at home, connects to the internet, and connects to this whole thing. So this is a typical web ar architecture. So you have, as mentioned, you have a front end, which is jQuery, Angular, JavaScript, Vue, everything based on JavaScript. A back end, which can be PHP or Python, Django, uh, Ruby as Ruby on Rails, which is the, the MVC architecture as well, or Node.js. And then you have a database, uh, which can be SQL, SQLite, MongoDB. Uh, it can even be uh, more fancy databases that do not use these relationship uh, models, like SQL uses relationship models. Uh, um, but yeah, this is the typical things. And in the, in the wild, you see SQL. That's like the, the more, the most common one. So now we go into web hacking. A bit more. So, user input. So, whenever you log in, you type some things. Whenever you uh, post a comment on Facebook, you type things. So, user input is something that can be very dangerous if you don't um, base, if you don't analyze your input properly, or if you don't process it properly, then it can lead to danger. And in this case, we go to um, an example of a common system which is uh, very simple. So you have a UI where you can post a comment. Uh, I'm sorry for the people in the back if it's uh, not that zoomed in. But um, yeah, so you can see this simple uh, posting comment. Comments get put into database and then get rendered like this. And this is one of my favorite crypto jokes. <laughs> Why did the crypto guy die of metal poisoning? Because he bit coin. <laughs> Anyway, this is an image I stole from uh, xsxss.com, but um, 
It explains uh, an attack that can be done on user input, especially if the input is rendered back inside the web page. And this attack is called cross-site scripting, which is a very uh, famous web application attack. So if, you've fam if you're familiar with this, then you've heard about it. So how does it work if I would want to do this attack? So I have my browser here. And what I would do is I would... Uh, basically puts a malicious script inside the web page. Because the, the, the input is rendered back, um, if you put code that actually gets executed by the, by the browser, then, uh, you have basically control over this page. And especially if you have a common system where everybody can see, uh, the, the, the code that you put there, then you can also affect other people's computers that would ac have access to the same web page. So in this case, uh, you, you put the, the malicious script in the comments. Uh, whenever uh, you go to this web page to see your comments, uh, it will print the, the contents of your script. And then uh, you, would have, you would see it inside the, the, web, the code of the web page itself. So to demo this, I'm going to go here. And hopefully... So I use this website because it's um, quite easy. And, and these are a little bit of challenges uh, to, to do XSS. So the website is called xssgame.upspot.com. If you want to have some fun at home with here, don't, don't look. Um, then then you, there are many more challenges, but I will show you an example of this, this rendered back attack. So here I'm supposed to search for something. So I'll just do like whatever. Don't look at this. So I search for this, and then I see here, hey, what I wrote in the in the search bar is printed back. So so bad that it saved my <laughs> input. <laughs> so let's say uh, the famous way to communicate in JavaScript uh, with a web page is to just type script like this, and I just say uh, I want to see what what happens when I print this. Hey. It doesn't get rendered. So, in this case, uh, if you're if you get a bit familiar with uh, web application of, or doing these attacks, you know that oh, it doesn't get rendered. That means that it the the web page is actually understanding the script tag as a as, as what it's used for. So, and, and even this disappeared. The rest disappeared. So, go back, and then I can do. The, this one that you can see here. Alert is basically a pop-up window. So in this case, I want to uh, say, okay, do a pop-up window and, and show XSS. Go here, and there it is. So this is the, the simple example of uh, reflected XSS. Going back to the slides. There are many more challenges. If you want to write down this website uh, to have some fun with it and uh, get experience, you, you, can, um, you can do this. So there are, of course, different types of uh, XSS attacks. And uh, in this case of this example, it was a reflected XSS, uh, which means that I was able to, to just enter this word and then it got reflected back to me. But a more dangerous type of, uh, of XSS is stored XSS because the input you put gets actually stored. And that's the example of the comment system. So if you put a malicious script inside a comment, it will be forever in that web page. And then people can have uh, immediate access to it. And then you can mess up with people's browsers, like printing cats everywhere, or make them execute requests to your web server. And in this case... You can get information about whoever uh, reads your page. And, um, DOM based XSS, it's, uh, it's basically when you have access to DOM variables. So this, you don't need to know this for now. Uh, you have the, the, the domain and there are some variables that are in the DOM. And if you are able to modify these variables, then everybody who would go to this web page will have the same modifications, uh, in their, in their browser. And because this is all in the victim's browser, we call it a client-side attack because it's on the client, on the user. It 
does not affect the server. Well, you can say it affects the server if you have a stored XSS because it's stored inside the server, but no, it doesn't mess with the web server itself. It messes with people's clients, people's browsers. So now the, the second danger of um, the most well-known user input flaws are SQL injections. And I'm going soon to show a little bit how the magic works. Uh, so in this case, you have a login form. So what does it do? Magic. Uh, it's connected to a database, and then the database says whether the person uh, can log in or not. In this case, uh, let's say I enter with, uh, my Valentine and then the Wicca for, for the win. And then basically the magic, what it asks is, uh, does the password match for user Valentine? And then in the database, there's this. And then it says yes, and I can log in. Bit more. This is JavaScript. Sort of. Anyway, it's pseudocode. So um, this would be on the controller, for example. So the, 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 the element in your web application that handles the logic between the model and the view. And the model is your database, the view is your uh, front end. So in this case, I have a function that checks the password. And this is basically basic SQL uh, syntax. And are you familiar with SQL? Who's not familiar with SQL in this case? Okay. <laughs> so in this case, it just says uh, select everything from the users. So select all users where the username matches this input and the password matches that input. And in this case, if, uh, if, the, if it matches, uh, so it, it executes the query. Uh, and if it exists, so if this uh, user exists, then you say password is correct or you say password is incorrect. Uh, but if you treat your input like this and you do not do uh, fancy processing, some bad things can happen. And I will show you why. So in this case, I put uh, Valentin, Wicca for the win, and this is the full query that happens uh, inside your, your logic of your controller. So what if... I do some fancy things because I know the format of this and I want to basically write my own queries. Uh, so I want to inject something in this query that will make it do something else for me than what is intended. Because basically what you're doing here is you're just taking the input and putting it like this in your query. So what if I input username Valentine and then quote? Or one equals one. One equals one is something that is always true. And in this case, you wanna, you want your query to return true. In any case. So basically, what it will, what will happen is it will say, does the password match for user Valentine or does one equal one? And in this case, it will be always be true. So this is what happens. So as you notice here, there's a little quote that comes here. So the entire query statement is then built as such. And here, the password field actually becomes blank. And then I can say, or was one equals one. So whatever ha comes into this before, the query will always be true. And now I'm going to show why. So this is a, a website we actually use uh, for demos when we try to get new clients. So, OK, so I typed. I want to log in as admin. Let's say. So you can help me here build something. Uh, but first, I will show you that um, if I ever am faced with a login form, the first thing I do is put a quote in the, in the field. Hmm? Oh, it's this. <laughs> I'll put it bigger. Like this? So I put a quote. This is, this is a quote. Login. Bam. Database error. In these cases, uh, that's where you know, oh, maybe there's a potential for SQL injection because you get a database error return, uh, something messed up in the ap application. And here, actually, the error tells me the query that failed, which is really nice because in this case, I can see how the query is constructed. So you can all see it here. It's a bit, it's very similar to, to the example. So you tell me, what should I put in?
club. Like this. That doesn't work. Why? Why it doesn't work is because of this. There is, it's, it's still, who? That? It still interprets the, the query with this. Basically, it automatically puts a quote at the end. So in this case, the query does not resolve. One thing you can do if you come across this is you can also tell, uh, the, you can also tell the, the application to just ignore everything else that is behind the query because sometimes you will also get queries that are super big and maybe you're injecting at the middle and then, uh, it will not match, it, it will not be nice with the rest of the query as in the, the, the input will be a bit screwed up. So in this case, you can say, I want to discard everything else that's behind. So you're basically commenting out everything else. And it is, and then you're in. And now the, the fun hacking demo, I will just show you everything. So in this case, you tried logging as admin, but you're not logged in as admin because it says here only administrators have access, blah, blah. So this, this is the, the fun uh, part. It's like, who am I? Oh, you're just a regular KPN user. And here you see profile UID one. UID stands for user ID one. So th this is the, just a fun demo. It has nothing to do with SQL injection. Put two. Hey, this is admin. But then I go to dashboard. Huh, it didn't remember it. Just ignore the remember password thing. So I go back here, say two, and then you say inspect element. Go here, very secure password. And then sure. So the password is very secure password. How do I log out here? So I'm like admin and then very secure password. Yay. Anyway, that was just the, the demo. I always start with admin. Yeah. So uh, often <laughs> in a lot of applications, unfortunately, especially if you're in a, a network that is uh, old, you would find applications that have default passwords. And in this case, Admin admin is a very common or root 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 tour by these things. So you have different uh, types of SQL injections, and uh, the first one is error based SQL. So that was a bit what we had. So you, you had the error back, and it showed the the SQL statements that was uh, handled. But then you sometimes have blind SQL injections. So you don't get an error, but you know there is an injection there, an injection point there. And often, uh, what happened to, to one in my, one of my test ones was that I would get a one or a zero printed on the page. And after doing some fun magic, you could see, uh, oh, the one is when it's true and the zero is when it's false. So in this case, uh, this is called a Boolean based blind SQL injection. And a Boolean is a true false, you know. Um, and in this case, uh, you can make very, very fancy statements that just ask, like, does the second letter of the password, is it an A? And then it will say zero and or one if it's actually an A. And in this case, if you write a bunch of statements, you can brute force passwords like this. And this is really uh, handy. And this is an actual server-side attack because you're directly uh, interacting with the server. File inclusion is also a very uh, famous attack, and this is very specific to PHP. And for example, in this case, oh, I didn't change it. Like our training was at Securify, so I used their website. So, <laughs> um, so in this case, you have let's say, let's say you have an application, display me what, and then you give it a page, and the, and then inside the page you you put the URL of what you want to display. Often you'll see that when they want to display a page or even a file on the server, there will be this include statement. So it makes a get request to the page here. Very famous for hackers, it's CPASSWD. It shows you all the users that are there and their right permissions and everything. So uh, what you would do is you would do this page equals Back, 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 etc. Pass to WD. And this is, this works because of this include statement. It just will print out the page, uh, that you put inside the page parameter. 
And sometimes uh, it doesn't even have to be a local file. It can be something that you host on your own malicious server. And then you host, for example, a malicious PHP script that is a reverse shell. Reverse shell is instructing the machine to connect back to you. And in this case, it would work because of oh, the include again. It uh, includes the script inside the logic of the page, and then the script gets executed. And in these two examples, we had a local file inclusion, which means that you're accessing files that are on the local file system of the web server. Or a remote file inclusion is you're accessing a file that is on the internet somewhere, and it can be your malicious script on your malicious server. And this is a server-side attack because you're, again, interacting directly with the server. Any questions so far? No? Good to go? Am I going too fast? Too furious? <laughs> No? Okay. So, um, the, the common mistakes to, to, uh, recapitulate is in web application programming. Uh, this is a quote I like. Learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make them all yourself. I really like this, uh, this quote. So, in this case, very important, trusting user input. That's one mistake that coders can make is that they assume that users are nice and that they won't try to put quotes everywhere or script tags. And then they don't have uh, proper exception handling. So in this case, uh, the, the error that was returned back to us when we did the, the quote was basically printing out the entire statement. And in this case, you can uh, easily craft your own statements. So if you uh, do expect your application to crash and you want to make it more secure, make sure that these errors are handled properly. Like if you get a quote in, don't display everything. And then the following the secure coding guidelines. So in this case, the secure coding guidelines would tell you like manage your input properly uh, and don't trust it, especially. And then when it comes to uh, sanitizing input, meaning that, uh, for example, you want to everybody who puts a quote, you just delete the quote in every message. For example, that the quote, the thingy, for, shit, what's it called? <laughs> the, the HTML tag thingy. Uh, so you, you basically process the input and sanitize it. In this case, you would remove uh, special characters that you don't want. But it might not be a good approach to remove things. Instead, just uh, so that the blacklist is like you check at everything that is not allowed, and then you, you just uh, forbid it. But the whitelist approach is better, so you have a list of characters that you allow instead of a list of characters you don't allow. Because hackers will always find a way to bypass some restrictions. Uh, for example, if you have a, a, a quote, if a quote is not allowed, then maybe a single quote is, or multiple quotes behind each other are allowed. So in this case, a whitelist approach is much better. Or you use parameterized queries, uh, which is basically prepared. Uh, yeah, it falls in the same category as prepared statements. So you have in the application. So PHP has frameworks for this. Python has frameworks for this too. Uh, directly communicate with the database without making your own queries. So the, you use a framework that talks to the database directly so you don't have to uh, make the queries yourself and have the danger that someone would put a uh, very malicious uh, piece of query. And restriction of resources applies to the local file inclusion uh, or remote file inclusion. In this case, if your application doesn't need to talk to other websites, just restrict that. Say, you're only allowed to use resources from this folder, on this file, uh, on this directory area. So, like this, you restrict uh, to where the application can go. Can okay, I drink some water? Sorry. Now we're going to go into the tooling. If you want a pizza, just grab something. All good? Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> okay, so tooling, the tools of the trade. So I'm not going to show all the tools because otherwise we'll still be here in two weeks. But there are some very uh, nice tools that make up the hacker's arsenal, which we use not every day, but almost. So this is the set of tools I'm going to present today. Kali, Nmap, WPScan, Beef, Burp. Hydra, SQL map, Nikto, and then you might wonder why the hell would you have an application called Burp, but whatever. So Kali. Kali is um, a distribution based on Debian. 
uh, provided by Offensive Security, who also do the OSCP, OSCE, if you've heard about this. And um, it's ha it has all the free hacking tools on the distribution. So you install the distribution, you install the OS, and you get the basic uh, hacker arsenal uh, for you. You don't have to install all the tools yourself. And uh, the standard root password is Tor, so you might want to change it if you use Kali. Because, you know, there are a bunch of services that are also available. Uh, if you port scan a Kali machine, you will see all the services that are open, and then you can log in if they didn't change the default password. So then you're hacking the hacker's tool. It's kind of funny. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, check it out. If you do want to do some uh, fun hacking challenges and you're, uh, you don't have the time to install all the tools, just grab a USB stick, put Kali on it, and then plug it in. Plug and play. So now we're going to look at more network tools. And map. That's a tool I use every day or at every start of every, te of every test. It's a network scanner. But it's uh, not only to scan a, a whole bunch of networks, but you can also scan specific hosts inside the network. And it's used uh, to discover the services that are running on this host. For example, uh, I have a host that has SSH open or uh, a web server, then you can actually use Nmap to scan the version of SSH, the version of the web server, and see maybe if there are some vulnerabilities. Nmap also can perform OS, de OS detection. So you can know, okay, is this a Windows machine? Is this Linux? Is this Mac? Oh no, you don't have your Mac today. <laughs> and it can even do simple scriptable attacks. Uh, for example, there are some, some, um, forms of SQL, uh, uh, MS SQL, I think. You can actually have direct shell access on the, on the machine. And then, uh, Nmap, you can just tell it, okay, run the script to get me a shell on uh, SQL. And then you just run the script and then you have ac direct access to the machine. So, and it has a nice of brute forcing scripts as well. FTP, SSH, I think, all this. So you can just use it as a basic vulnerability scanner and basic exploitation tool. And this is how you would run Nmap. Uh, this performs a ping scan on a specific range. Uh, v for verbose, so it will show you like the progress or more information about how it's doing, how it's feeling, all of this. Uh, dash A is aggressive. All scan, it will do OS detection, it will try to run scripts, it will do a bunch of things. Dash P dash, so Nmap uh, usually runs uh, on the top thousand ports, most common thousand ports. Uh, dash P dash is everything, 65, 530, something, something like this. It's 65,500, yeah, something like this, yeah. <laughs> 65,000 and more. Uh, SU, UDP. Because uh, uh, some services are in UDP and these are not in the top common ports, so it do a UDP scan. You need pseudo writes because it actually uh, calls your network interface, your network card interface, and in this case, you need to be privileged user in order to access your card uh, interface. I think OS detection is same, and then this is a, a way you um, you run script. So you say script FTP brute. It will try to brute force FTP credentials. FTP is a just a file. Uh, uh, yeah, file transfer protocol, but it's basically a remote file system somewhere, if you, if you don't know. And that, that runs on port 21, and you run it here. Example output. So in this case, I run nmap on example.com. There is a HTTP, HTTPS, and SSH, which is might be there. So filtered means might be there, might not be. You didn't get a response, or you didn't get a response that you could understand. Sometimes you get a response uh, that just says no. That means it's closed. I always find it helpful to throttle sometimes, so you can scan more or less undetected. Yeah. Uh, I've had clients that we did a scan on three, three IPs, all, all the ports, and within five minutes we got a call that we're sim flooding them. Yeah, <laughs> you were doffing. The question I was going to ask is why, yeah. because sometimes it's easy to, to see the scan that's Yeah, of course. Yeah. So. For the detection people, um, Nmap sends the Nmap user agent as well. So that's also something to, to detect. So Nmap will uh, send something in this, with the system that says, oh, I'm, I'm Nmap, I'm scanning you. So it's nice. But also, indeed, they, they check on the number of connections per second. And you can see when someone is scanning you, it's just a bunch of requests at the same time. So you have indeed throttling where you can slow Nmap down or speed it up, depending 
what you want. Uh, yeah, dash T, dash capital T, one. One, two, five. Yeah. Never use five. <laughs> Never use five, unless they're, you're completely undetected and you don't care. Yeah. And <laughs> so one is slow and, uh, and then you might not be detected, but then again, like, it's, it's quite easy to detect nmap. But if you're testing something, use nmap. Web application tools for web hacking. So this is uh, WP scan for WordPress applications. We were talking about PHP being broken. Uh, WordPress uh, is also quite broken sometimes. SQL map for the exploitation of SQL databases. Beef, which is a XSS framework. Nikto is a uh, like Nmap, but specifically for web applications. And Burp, which is very powerful, and we're going to see that in a bit. So WP scan uh, only works on web WordPress websites. If you use it on a website that is not WordPress, it will tell you this is not WordPress. So uh, you just give it a URL. You can enumerate users. You can enumerate uh, the, the database. You can enumerate plugins that are installed on the web application. So it's really nice. And you can even try to brute force the admin interface uh, with passwords. So like you give it a word list of passwords, and it will try to use this bunch of passwords. WordPress application, default password is admin, admin, or default login is admin, admin, I think, or WP admin, admin, something like this. WP it's, admin. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, uh, really, uh, default. And if you actually scan the web for WordPress applications, you will find a lot of them that still have the default password. But don't do it. <laughs> SQL map is a bit of the same. Like, you can enumerate tables of the database, uh, dump users, uh, dump columns and even try to get a shell if you have uh, credentials or if you have access to the database. If you can log into the database, then you can maybe get a shell access. But this is same thing. It's going to try to uh, perform SQL injection for you. So you also give it, in the SQL map, you can give it exactly in which fields uh, it has to do, do, do its input, and then it will just try to do a bunch of mean input and see if you can get in. And beef is a bit, um, I actually never used it because in this case you want to uh, target maybe someone because in this, you want to get information from other people in this case, uh, at least in this example. So the framework, you install it locally, you run a little server, a beef server, which is here, and it's uh, basically a JavaScript hook. And uh, in this case, in the vulnerable application, you would uh, basically tell with a JavaScript code to hook to this application, to your beef server. And then uh, whenever, so if you post this in the comment system, let's say, uh, someone visits your comment, and then they will be hooked to your web server without them knowing. And in this case, you would get a whole bunch of information about who connected to you, who was hooked to your server. And it would be information about session cookies, uh, IP address, and uh, a bunch of other things. Host name, OS can maybe do even detect the OS where it comes from, and everything. So in this case, you would have a, it's kind of like a management interface for XSS. Let's call it like this. And in this case, you see that someone connected like this, uh, but everybody who, who sees your comment, you will get all the information from these people. And Nikto is basically a script, Perl script. Uh, you give it a host name and it will try to see if it can find uh, vulnerability, low hanging fruit vulnerabilities. So if vulnerabilities you can immediately detect based on uh, Apache version or these kind of things. So this is just scanning a website. Burp. It's a graphical tool. It's a very nice interface for web penetration testing. It's like, I use it every day. You probably use it every day. She does too. So it's uh, something where you can do a lot of things with. And I'm not going to show everything today, but I'll show the intercept request and response. So Burp is a proxy tool. So it sits between you and the web application. And it can intercept requests, show you what the, the request is, and then you can decide to modify it, uh, change some things, and then it will send that modified request. Uh, to the server, and then the response, you can also intercept the response and basically do some analysis on it. 
It has a crawler function. So you give it, if you visit a website, Burp will automatically try to crawl, even basic crawling. If you have the pro tool, because I have the pro, don't know if you use Burp Pro. <laughs> but uh, it will try to crawl the application and see um, if there are some directories, uh, sensitive files. It, it even has like a basic uh, vulnerability scanner for web applications. And uh, the intruder tool I really like, it's uh, basically, for example, if you have this uh, logging form and uh, you tell it the f what the fields are, uh, you can also try to brute force things with Burp. And it's, it's really nice. And I'm going to show it to you on the Hacking Demo website. So first I log out. So in order to, to tell uh, that I'm going to connect to Burp like this, basically the, the, the settings, I tell it this is the, the, the address of, of the, the proxying of Burp. Standard, 8080, like this. Now, this is what it looks like. Might be a bit small. I, don't know if I can make it bigger. <clears throat> so I go here. Sorry, many pages. And in this case, it intercepted the request. No, no we don't care about this. <laughs> this is Mozilla stuff, uh, whatever. Yeah. Oh, went a bit too fast. Doing it again, sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, the request that it intercepted. So it makes a get request to the logging of hacking demo. And then you have this uh, session cookie that's from my previous session. And then it basically recorded a target. Uh, it's too bad. Actually, I zoomed in last time. Do you, do you, does anyone know how to zoom in on Burp? Because I think I zoomed in last time. User options. No. Ah. I think we're not going to spend too much time on this. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember how I zoomed in last time. User option display. Can, uh, oh. Size. Uh, oh yes. Oh. Uh, Twenty. Sure. Let's go. Burp professional. The uh, the normal burp community uh, will do some throttling. So like the intruder, for example. So the intruder sends like thousands of requests, uh, but with the uh, Normal version, uh, I think you can only send like one per second or something. Oh, nice. Better? Maybe. Yeah. Hope so. So, uh, let's say I say admin, admin. Poof. So right here, session again. So now it makes a post request to the authentication page. So it was a form, it was logging form. So it's normal that you have a post request. Um, and you see uh, admin, admin. Now let's say I want to see how the application behaves on different inputs. So I, and I don't have to do it uh, all the time in the web browser. I can say send to repeater. And then, yeah, so then I can just send multiple times this uh, this request, and you can see that I get a response back which says access granted is false. And here you can try a bunch of things like admin one two three, and you will see this. And then of course you see the the very secure password, I think. Go, and then you see access granted is true. So here you can uh, test out a bunch of things on the. Uh, on the, without having to interact with the web application. And it's very nice. Other things, uh, like I was saying, the intruder, this thing. Here you can choose the positions where you're going to inject a bunch of things. So, uh, I want to inject on the password. And payloads, uh, 
you can either add like, okay, I want to try this SQL injection. So now it will be in the list. Or I want to try multiple passwords. One, two, three, or things. And I want to try this, like this. So then you say start attack. And then you see, oh, I got a 200 back. I got a server error, 500. Or, hey, look, I got a 200 back, but it's much bigger than these ones. So then you look and you see, oh, yeah, my access was granted. So here it shows you the, the length of the page. Uh, here it shows you the status code. And, uh, yeah, in this case, what database error, you remember when we just did this thing, it was a database error, so it makes sense that the status 500. And another uh, powerful things about the, the intruder is that you can even load word lists. So in this case, uh, my favorite go-to word list repository is something from Seclist. And Seclist is on GitHub. It's a giant repository with a bunch of word lists for everything. And in this case, I want to uh, do passwords and then default credentials. So you have like default passwords, bunch of lists for default passwords. Uh, this is also a very famous default password list, the dark web top 1000. Uh, yeah, so here you can put this word list and then it will try all of these things. So if you see your password in there, thing to change it. So yeah, I'm actually quite impressed. That's like, I I don't know why this would be Pokemon. Oh, that's nice. Anyway, so this was Burp. Very short introduction of Burp. Any questions about this tool? Okay. There's much more, huh? because if you go here and you say scan, it will actually start a big scan. Crawl and audit means that it will actually try to do things on its own. And if you just want to crawl the website, just crawl, and then it will start in the background here and actually finished. View the details, event log, nothing much interesting. Yes. So after burp, we have the last two brief forcing tools when just guessing random passwords won't do it. And this is Hydra, which is um, a, path, a password brute force tool. There's many more. There's John the Ripper, Hashcat, all these things. They're brute forcing tools. And uh, well, what I like about Hydra is that it's, uh, it can directly interface with SSH. So SSH, uh, you, it's just a way to log in securely to a machine remotely. It's called Secure Shell. So you get a shell on a machine if you have the credentials. And what you can do with Hydra, you can tell it, uh, use user Wicca, use password, a word list, and then connect to this machine with SSH, and it will just brute force for you. So that's what I like about Hydra. So once you've done all these exploitation and you, uh, something we love to do as hackers is get shells, pop shells. And uh, this is the meaning of getting a shell. So you have on the tar specific target machine, it listens, uh, there's an NCAT, NETCAT listener, so it's a specific type of network connection, network connector thing. Uh, so you listen on port 1 through 37, and on that port, this is run. This is a shell. And then if I want to connect to this thing, I just put the IP address, in this case it was my local host, this local host, connect to port 137, and then basically you can run uh, Unix bash commands. Unix commands. So you have direct shell access to a machine. So you can interact with the file system, you can run executables, you can uh, get the, the ID. So ID is the user ID. Zero is always root. Uh, usually users are 1000. Uh, and then you have many things that are like different IDs for databases, different permissions, everything. And then you name dash A is our favorite thing to know the, the distribution, the OS that is running on the system. Uh, and then ls is listing the, all the files. Get into, so you have different types of, um, shells, a bind shell. So you're connecting your machine to that machine. So this is the example of a bind shell. This is running on the machine and I connect to it. Reverse shell, as mentioned before, is when you instruct the, the target machine to connect to your shell. And then you have, uh, the, the machine connecting to you 
and you have direct access to this machine. So the question here is, when would you choose a bind shell over a reverse shell? Like, can you think of a scenario why it would be handier to uh, to have the machine uh, to for you to connect to the machine directly, or vice versa, the machine connects to you? Can you think of any scenario? Hmm? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah. Wait, what do you mean? Yeah, that's uh, possible. In that case, um, it would be nice to do it un undetected. Let's say in this case, you don't connect to it, so they don't see it. It connects to you. Yeah. Another thing is uh, when I use bind shells is, for example, if I'm behind a NATed IP. So a uh, reverse shell, you need to give it your IP address. But if you don't have a public IP and a NATed IP, so it's behind, it's inside the network, uh, it won't know where to connect, especially if you're communicating over the web. So in this case, uh, you would make pop pop this shell here this one on the machine on the uh, victim machine and then connect to the machine so this is a very good example of what how why you would use a bind shell is if you're behind a nutted ip so now we have a shell what do we do privilege escalation so this is the get root get system and in this case uh very very dumb uh, example is uh, you have a shell here uh, you, you are the victim. Who am I is what user am I? Uh, your ID is 1000 because you're the victim. Yeah, LS secrets. Uh, you, permission is denied because you don't have the, the root access. So in this case, you would maybe, uh, want to look at the kernel or look at the information about the kernel, the DOS distribution, and say you find some famous kernel exploits. Uh, you've heard about Eternal Blue. You've heard about uh, dirty cow, all these kernel exploits are very famous, uh, for, uh, old system. And especially that they are published. So you get a C script, you compile it, put it on the machine, run it, and then it finishes and you, your root. And in this case, you basically don't need, uh, to know more. You don't need to know anything about how it works. You just need to know how to compile it. And uh, then you can get the super secret file and this stuff. So uh, to, to finish this part uh, about uh, the basics of application security and the basics of uh, hacking, um, we're going to talk about the more serious stuff about web security. And there is, uh, so we talk about cross scripting, SQL injection, file inclusion. And in order to, to have a repository of, okay, because it's nice to have an overview of what attacks are out there, what can uh, we do to defend it? You have this organization from which this guy is part of, uh, OWASP, uh, which is the, the Open Web Application Security Project. It is a, a very nice uh, repository of knowledge about web application security and web application hacking. And uh, what I like to refer to uh, is the OWASP Top 10, which is the top 10 most common vulnerabilities on the web. And these are these. The latest release is 2017, right? Oh, they have a new one now. It's on GitHub. It's not anymore on their thing, but yeah, but it's, it hasn't changed, I guess, but, <laughs> but maybe they're building one. I don't know, but I know that they ported, um, their list to GitHub now. But yeah, so injection, uh, injection, we saw it, uh, broken authentication session management. So for example, I can steal someone else's session. That was the example of the hacking demo from KPN. Uh, sensitive data exposure, of course, like you have data sensitive files that are available to everybody. And then you have many more uh, broken access control. So like uh, as a normal user, I can suddenly access admin stuff. The, something is broken there. And what's really nice about OWASP um, is that they will tell you like what it is, how to abuse it, and how to defend it. And it's really nice. So in our case, we, we saw these ones. Security misconfigurations, cross-site scripting, and uh, especially when it comes to WordPress applications, WordPress use of a lot of plugins that could be uh, vulnerable. So you're using components in your application with known vulnerabilities, and that's bad. This is um, very nice if you are a coder and if you are an attacker. 
So I'm doing some OS promotion here, but I like them. And they have foam rockets. Those are awesome. <laughs> yeah. So now we can take a break, uh, finish some pizza, take 15 minutes, mingle, and then we will pursue further. Yeah, so moving uh, back to part two, we're still on July 29th. Uh, so now we're, like I said before, we're going to talk about the network compromisation. We're going to do some Metasploit hands-on, which is the exploit tool, very powerful. And uh, some more about privilege escalation, because I talked to you about kernel exploits, just running a script, but there are some more tricks you can use, and then some things about securing this. We have one hour, about one hour left, and then we can just go. So, uh, talking about uh, what we just talked about, uh, SQL injection was, um, in this case, very simple because you're basically just injecting all the input that is put inside your application into a query and you're building this query based on that. Uh, so, in this case, if I would put uh, my password, then it would look like this. This is a valid SQL query. Uh, it says select everything where this username match this and this password match that. Uh, and if I inject this payload with closing the quote or one equals one, the query will always be true. Any questions on this? Let's go injection. Okay. And then we talked about OWASP, uh, which was this very awesome uh, open web application security project uh, with a bunch of documentation on methodologies, how to secure things, uh, how to attack things, and basically a, a huge repository of knowledge, open source, a lot of people are contributing to it. They have meetups in Holland as well. Uh, really cool people. And Nerf Rockets. Uh, yeah, so the OWASP.10... Uh, the most common vulnerabilities in web applications. Uh, also very interesting. I suggest uh, go one day on the OWASP website and read them for yourself. And if if you are building a web application, if you're a developer, then it's, it's really handy as well to follow these guidelines because they have very strong guidelines. So we go back to getting a shell as well, which was uh, I have uh, a Netcat listener open here on port 137, and I'm hosting uh, this shell. So if people, if someone will connect to it, I have direct shell access on uh, this machine. So uh, now a, a bit about uh, instead of focusing on the web applications, the larger uh, picture with a full network compromisation. So red teaming 101. And it all starts with I'm inside the network and I scan for vulnerabilities. We have Nmap again, uh, with the, like I said before, with this uh, open source network scanner. Uh, which can do OS detection, it, can, it sees open ports, and can even do some scriptable attacks. And then we go to the much bigger tools, OpenVAS, which is free, and Nessus, which is not free. Um, they're basically, uh, they, they're an interface. Instead of having a command line tool, it's a big interface with uh, a management of your vulnerabilities. So, uh, you give it a, a range of IP addresses, and then it will perform all the very aggressive scans, much aggressive, more aggressive than uh, than the Nmap, and uh, you will have a nice overview as such with pie charts, vulnerabilities. This is a listing of the vulnerabilities that it found, and uh, even like the CVSS score, which is a so the CVSS score is a method for scoring the gravity of a vulnerability. So. This is very good when you talk to management. You say, okay, you have a CVSS score of 10, change it. This, this is a way that we can communicate with management. And then Nessus looks a little bit nicer than OpenVAS. OpenVAS is on Kali Linux, by the way. So uh, you can you have it directly installed. Nessus is, uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, this says advanced scan. So it will do an, an advanced scan, much more advanced than um, Nmap. But then it can do host discovery, it can do even PCI networks, so credit card stuff, um, co just payment card stuff, basic network scan. It will do some uh, detection of common vulnerabilities and all of this. So I'll show you what... Uh, so my computer is called Storm Pooper. But basically... Is it still there? Like this. So I have to log in. Oh, look at this. Bam. Use key pass, by the way. Always use key pass. And this is the interface of Nessus. I'm going to... Fuck. Shit. <laughs> this one. 
There you go. Um, zoom in. Yeah, so this is uh, the result of a scan. So in this case, uh, you will have a list of all the scans that you executed. So I call this one less demo. And in this case, uh, I was running a, nor a web application test because I, I was testing a web application. And in this case, I was testing the hacking demo website for the SQL injection. So you can see your list or here it found two very critical vulnerabilities, too high, five medium, low, and then this is just basic reconnaissance. So you can see uh, multiple PHP issues. Uh, yeah, th these are very common um, vulnerabilities that even Nikto, the web application scanner, will also detect. Uh, I'm actually curious if it saw the SQL injection. So here in this case, it says uh, unsupported version. So these are uh, versions from PHP that are, that are vulnerable. Um, yeah, in this case, I didn't tell it to aggressively. So you, I can tell it just do a basic scan without fiddling with input or do a more advanced scan and uh, change input yourself with the risk of destroying the application. In this case, I didn't do it because it's not my applications. It's actually from my boss, so I don't want him to uh, kill me. Not Jaya, but the one below Jaya. And um, uh, yeah, so if I would tell it uh, you're allowed to fiddle with input, then in this case, it would probably detect the SQL injection. So yeah. So once you are in the network and you've run all your vulnerability scans and uh, you know where the vulnerabilities are or potential vulnerabilities, you go into exploitation. And this is where we go into Metasploit. Metasploit is a tool for exploitation. It's made by Rapid7, which is also a community of hackers and they have a lot of documentation trainings about hacking. Um, it's a penetration uh, testing tool that, is ba that basically has a whole repository of exploits and a lot of uh, past versions of specific software. Uh, they have, uh, like you say in Dutch, content klare exploits, so ex exploits that are ready to use uh, immediately. And uh, Metasploit has this uh, this code base inside its own. Logic and it basically uh, will be able to just execute these exploits without you having to do any effort. It even provides a tool for shellcode generation. So if you want to generate shellcode to open shells on machines, you can use Metasploit, MSA Venom, and it also provides uh, scanners as well. So so you have Nmap, you have Nessus, you have Metasploit that does scanning. They they all do a bunch of scanning, and it has Meterpreter, which is a shell on steroids. So it's a shell specifically for Windows. You can install, uh, so you compromise a Windows machine, you install Meterpreter, and then Meterpreter connects back to you, and then you have uh, f not only direct file, ac uh, file system access, but you can also do much more. You can install a keylogger, for example, to see what the p people on this machine are typing. You can, uh, what else? You can, you can do a bunch of things with Meterpreter. You can dump hashes, so anyone who's logged in uh, who has a session on this Windows machine, you can dump the hashes from this session, uh, hashes of the passwords, and then crack the hashes, and then you get everybody's passwords, these things. And it provides also post-exploitation post tooling. So you have access to a machine, and then you want to elevate privileges. Uh, you can just, from Meterpreter and from Metasploit as well, you can say, okay, what, mod what uh, type of kernel exploit or... Uh, exploits to elevate privileges can I do in order to do this. So it's great. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo on my own uh, Metasploitable, which is really nice because Metasploit also provides the Metasploitable, which is a virtual machine that has a bunch of vulnerabilities so you can practice Metasploit on, and you are going to use it in a bit. My terminal. Ooh. So this is the Metasploit interface. Actually, I'm gonna it's way too big, way too small. Do it like this. Ooh. Is it okay like this? Yeah. So in this case, um, 
I've loaded the Metasploit console. So you, uh, how you start it? You say MSF uh, console or just MSF. And then it opens. And then you can, uh, in this case, it's open on the, on this exploit. And you do like this and this, it, this is how you say use this specific exploit. I went a bit too fast because I just realized that I haven't shown you how I got to this exploit. Yes, it's the very interesting terminal output. <laughs> this Kausei, look, Kausei says funny stuff. Ooh. This is just to show you. <laughs> oh, you can say it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I have the Metasploitable, which is here. Can't make it bigger. But this is the IP address, 192.168.0.10. That's what you're going to have to uh, hack later. So I say uh, nmap, my favorite one. Don't look at this. Um, it's verbose, and I just want to see uh, what the services are. So 168.0.10. And this is just v for verbose, because I want to see what nmap is doing. So here, like, this was really fast, because probably was cached, because I did it today. So here you see, like, it started it, did a ping scan, parallel DNS resolution. And then it discovered a bunch of open ports. And in this case, the one I'm interested in is this one. And then if I want to do something more aggressive uh, to see exactly what type of version is running there, uh, like this, 168.0.10. And then I specify, specify the port 6667. Go. Bam. Pfft. Like this. So it found this Unreal IRCD. Uh, yeah. Some information about the network. So as hackers, we like Google. So this is a very nice meta, meta, uh, meta exploit. Terminal tool, the Googler. Oh, of course I don't have internet. Anyway. So if you Google this, if you just Google this information and this version of this software, you will quickly find an exploit. Uh, for it, it will image it. It will actually, if you Google this, it will say, uh, look at Metasploit. Anyway. So then you say, you know what? I'm gonna, could you start it again? MSF console. Boop. Yay. They also have fancy decoration. Uh, I think you can just search IRC. Yeah. So in this case, you, you search the Metasploit database, uh, for an exploit that fits you. Uh, I already know it, but I'm trying to see if I can find it here. Cause it's quite big. This one. This one. Yeah, Unreal IRCD. That's the, that matches here. So in this case, I will use this. I have it here. Poof. So now you tell Metasploit, load this module. And you say options. What are all the options that are possible? In this case, you can specify a host, remote host, a port. Default port for uh, IRCD is 6667. And Metasploit knows this as well. Uh, if you have web uh, tools, it will also put uh, uh, web exploits. It will also put port 80 or something. So in this case, I say set our host, because I want to set the R host to 192.168.0.10. Automatic target means it will uh, deduce on its own what OS is there. And in this case, it's it's just a basic Unix thing. So ooh, what happened? Oh, yeah, run, go. So now it does stuff, everything, write socket, blah. Command shell session open. LS, ooh. ID, I'm root, uh, I'm in this directory because this is where the application runs. So then you can say like, show me everything that's in the root folder. And then you can see like super secret stuff, probably. Anyway, you name dash A, you're on the Metasploitable machine, Linux server, all this. So this is how you would use Metasploit to compromise a machine. In this case, you're already root. So, uh, basically, game over. 
Now comes the interesting part, because it's DIY, this is not the right IP, but DIY. So you will connect to the network that is right here. And did you all manage to connect? No. Yeah. Okay. So, and you can try to um, exploit this machine using Metasploit. It would be nice if, uh, so you group your, I think you can make groups of four in this case, because we're exactly a multiple of four, which is nice. So make group of four, groups of four and try to uh, do the same exploit or do something else. There are multiple services that are open. You can first run Nmap and uh, see what all the services that are there. And uh, if you need help, uh, I'm here. Andrea's here. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, have a fun, uh, f have a go. And if you Google, uh, yeah, unfortunately you don't have internet right now, um, but there is a metasploitable guide as well online. You can just load it on your phone, and it will tell you things if you if you really wanna uh, have a tutorial to do this. If you wanna just go crazy, then do it. All right, so I'm really glad that everybody, uh, every group was able to get a shell. That's uh, really nice. I heard that another group uh, did it with another exploit, which was also really nice. Uh, so now that you have a shell, now what? And this is where we go back to the privilege escalation in a little bit more detail, and then we can go home. <laughs> so uh, what is a kernel? So because I was talking about kernel exploit and stuff. Put it simply, uh, the kernel is kind of like a, a thing between your, your OS and the hardware. Let's say it like this. And in order to talk to the hardware of your computer without, so to prevent you from fucking things up, uh, you need often, uh, root privileges or system privileges. At least like the super privileges in order to actually access the kernel and talk to the, uh, talk to the hardware through the kernel. So, and a lot of, uh, exploits, kernel exploits, people actually found loopholes, vulnerabilities in these ways of communicating with the hardware that they were able to, uh, basically exploit the kernel. This is, uh, the, the idea, the gist of it. A cron job, and cron jobs are really interesting as well. So a cron job or a task in Windows is basically something that you can schedule inside your computer. Like, for example, every hour I want to delete this folder or clear this folder, do these things. And you will find that a lot of cron jobs uh, run as root or as system in Windows. So if you are able to change cron jobs uh, that are running as root, you might be able to just say, okay, I want to change this cron job to instead of clearing this folder, it's going to connect to my machine. And if you're able to do that, then the computer will connect to your machine as root. And in this case, you have a root shell on the machine or a system shell. So th these are also really interesting to look at. There are some funny uh, one-liner uh, that you can just look for all the, the cron jobs that you can write to as a user. So if you have user uh, rights, uh, that you can change those cron jobs that are running as root. This is really nice. Bit more details. Uh, this is the, the common ways of doing privilege escalation on uh, Linux or Windows. So in terms of getting root or getting system. So famous Linux exploits are dirty cow, sock sent page. There are famous kernel exploits. There are scripts for that online. There's metasploit modules. There's a bunch of things. Misconfigura misconfigurations, as we said, like uh, cron jobs or writable etc shadow. etc shadow is where the hashes of passwords are stored, passwords from users. In this case, if you have a writable etc shadow, you're not supposed to be able to write to it, even read it. Uh, you could actually change, uh, just remove the, the, the password hash for root, and then root suddenly has no password anymore. So this is really nice. Or you have services that are running with too many privileges. In the Metasploit case, you saw that uh, the IRC, uh, Unreal RCD thing was running as root because as soon as you got a session on the machine, you were immediately root. That means that machine, that service was running as root. Um, we credentials is the last one, but it's the first thing you try actually when you're pen testing. And it's win with Windows, uh, MS-08067 uh, is a very famous one, uh, Net API at join leaf. There are very famous kernel exploits, but you have eternal blue. These things, uh, they're very famous, and you can, you have Metasploit modules for it, you have uh, content cloud exploits for them. And misconfiguration is the same thing, task scheduler is the, the cron job story, same thing. 
So uh, this is really great when you want to elevate privileges inside a computer, inside a network. Uh, just look at this, um, the famous exploits, the configurations, and files that you can write to. Then uh, another uh, very nice concept is set UID, and this is something in Unix, uh, in Linux specifically. And these are basically um, binaries or, or executables that run as the permissions of someone else. So when you run this file, it will, for example, run as root. Ping, for example. You can run ping, but it runs as root because it has set UID thing. So let's say you would be able to write, to change the, the, the when you say ping, blah, blah. So to write, to change the ping binary to uh, connect back to my machine, then whenever you say ping, it will connect back to your machine as root. So this is the example of set UID. And this is a way to find, let's say, a command to find all the set UID binaries. So this is, uh, because this is the permission ID for set UID. And in this case, you would get all the files that are, uh, that have set UID permissions and then, uh, keep an eye out for the custom ones. So sometimes, uh, for example, the root user of a computer, let's say, uh, he or she wants to, uh, to create a file, uh, to create a script that is, uh, that runs as, uh, their own permissions. Uh, then you can find this file and then you can edit it nicely, maybe. And if you can uh, make the machine connect back to you, you will have root or, yeah, root immediately. So this is a, a nice, uh, way of exploiting Linux systems. So lateral movement, uh, to be precise, this is once basically you're, you're inside the network, you compromise the computer. What do you do? Well, let's say you were able to compromise this guy or girl. Uh, and you want to access these secret files, but everything is behind firewalls. So in this case, you would compromise this computer. Then you compromise this computer. And because this computer can talk to this one, you immediately have access there. And because this one can talk to this one, you can retrieve these things. This is like the concept of uh, lateral movement, the art of pivoting, let's say. And pivoting is basically you have an initial foothold, foothold inside the network, and then you move uh, laterally inside the network from compromised machine to compromised machine. And, uh, easy one, uh, easy technique is to route traffic through a stepping stone machine or an intermediary machine using a SOX proxy, SSH tunneling or port forwarding. And this is basically routing your, your traffic through a specific machine that you have access to. So with SSH, you do, uh, if you SSH to a machine and you want to route your traffic through this machine, you do SSH minus capital D 2000, and then you route all your traffic through port 2000, and then it will actually go through that machine. And then the final words, of course, because this is really nice, we talked about hacking a bunch of stuff, but how do we actually defend ourselves? Because it's really nice to break things, but then some people need to build it up again. And the basis of, of this is logging. Log all the traffic, log everything that's happening inside your network, and from these logs, uh, find, do some analysis, find incidents, find a way to detect when you're getting hacked and all of this. But the basis of it all is logging. And of course, for web application security, follow the OS guidelines. And with that, this is the end. And I really hope that, uh, that you learned something today and that it was, uh, that you were able to follow everything. And this is our email if you have questions, Twitter, follow us. And uh, we're really happy that you could make it today, actually. <laughs>